Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 305 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about Kincaid's Cave and Egyptian artifacts in the Grand Canyon. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1909, the Phoenix Gazette reported on an astonishing discovery in the Grand Canyon. An explorer named G.E. Kincaid had found a cave high up in a cliff wall above the Colorado River. The cave contained strange artifacts that appeared to be both Egyptian and Asian and the Smithsonian Institution was now excavating it. But then the story vanished, and when it was rediscovered, some began to suspect a scientific cover-up. So what's the truth about Kincaid's cave? What did it contain, and what implications does it have for the history of archaeology and mankind? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Jimmy, when and where does today's mystery begin? Back in the year 1909, in what was then the Arizona Territory, Arizona didn't become a state until three years later in 1912, but it was already a fascinating place, and one of the fascinating places in it is the Grand Canyon, which is one of the largest canyons on Earth. The capital of Arizona is Phoenix, and on Friday, March 12, 1909, a newspaper in Phoenix, Arizona, known alternately as the Phoenix Gazette and the Arizona Gazette, carried a brief story that read as follows. G.E. Kincaid reaches Yuma. G.E. Kincaid of Lewiston, Idaho, arrived in Yuma after a trip from Green River, Wyoming, down the entire course of the Colorado River. He is the second man to make this journey and came alone in a small skiff, stopping at his pleasure to investigate the surrounding country. He left Green River in October, having a small covered boat with oars and carrying a fine camera with which he secured over 700 views of the river and canyons, which were unsurpassed. Mr. Kincaid says one of the most interesting features of the trip was passing through the sluiceways at Laguna Dam. He made this perilous passage with only the loss of an oar. Some interesting archaeological discoveries were unearthed, and altogether the trip was of such interest that he will repeat it next winter in the company of friends. So a gentleman from Idaho, Mr. G.E. Kincaid, had navigated the Colorado River down as far as Yuma, Arizona. The Colorado River begins in the state of Colorado and then flows westward throughout southern Utah. It then enters northern Arizona, and the Grand Canyon is along a particular stretch of the river in this area. It then meets uh, with the border of Nevada and flows down it. It then flows down the border with California, and at the bottom of this is Yuma, Arizona, where Mr. Kincaid was headed. The river then flows down into Mexico, and it empties into the Gulf of California, which is between the Mexican states of Baja, California, and Sonora. According to Mr. Kincaid, he took hundreds of pictures on his trip. He had an interesting time passing through the the sluiceways at Laguna Dam, which is down near Yuma, which had been built in 1905, so it was still new. He planned to repeat his trip with friends in late 1909 or early 1910, and he'd made some interesting archaeological discoveries, but this story doesn't tell us what they were. Then, just over three weeks later, on Monday, April 5th, 1909, the Gazette carried a front-page story under the headlines, Explorations in the Grand Canyon. Mysteries of immense rich cavern being brought to light. Jordan is enthused. Remarkable finds indicate ancient people migrated from Orient. When the body of the story began, it said, The latest news of the progress of the explorations of what is now regarded by scientists as not only the oldest archaeological discovery in the United States, but one of the most valuable in the world, which was mentioned some time ago in the Gazette, was brought to the city yesterday by G.E. Kincaid. The explorer who found the great underground citadel of the Grand Canyon during a trip from Green River, Wyoming, down the Colorado River, in a wooden boat, to Yuma several months ago. So Kincaid had just brought news to the Gazette about the archaeological discoveries that he had made and that had been mentioned in the previous story. He said that as he was making his trip a few months ago, he found a great underground citadel in the Grand Canyon. 
And scientists had now said that it was the oldest archaeological discovery in the United States and one of the most valuable in the world. According to the story related to the Gazette by Mr. Kincaid, the archaeologists of the Smithsonian Institute, which is financing the expeditions, have made discoveries which almost conclusively prove that the race which inhabited this mysterious cavern, hewn in solid rock by human hands, was of oriental origin, possibly from Egypt, tracing back to Ramses. If their theories are borne out by the translation of the tablets engraved with hieroglyphics, the mystery of the prehistoric peoples of North America, their ancient arts, who they were and whence they came will be solved. Egypt and the Nile and Arizona and the Colorado will be linked by a historical chain running back to ages, which staggers the wildest fancy of the fictionist. So archaeologists from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. were now investigating Kincaid's find. The citadel was located in a cavern that had been hewn from the rock by ancient humans, and it contained tablets engraved with hieroglyphs that may have been Egyptian. This would suggest that the people were of Eastern or Oriental origin, but they needed to translate the tablets to be sure, which was now possible because Francois Champollion had figured out how to read Egyptian hieroglyphs back in the 1820s. And by the way, the correct term is hieroglyphs, not hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphic is an adjective, while hieroglyph is a noun. But we can forgive the 1909 Arizona Gazette for that. The article continued, A thorough investigation. Under the direction of Professor S.A. Jordan, the Smithsonian Institute is now prosecuting the most thorough explorations, which will be continued until the last link in the chain is forged. So this tells us who from the Smithsonian was heading the project. It was Professor S.A. Jordan. He's also the Jordan mentioned in the Jordan is enthused headline. And it's easy to understand why he was enthused, because they had found some really amazing things. Nearly a mile underground, about 1,480 feet below the surface, the long main passage has been delved into to find another mammoth chamber from which radiates scores of passageways, like the spokes of a wheel. Several hundred rooms have been discovered, reached by passageways running from the main passage, one of them having been explored of 854 feet, and another 634 feet. Based on the tombs that have been found in Egypt, such as in the Valley of the Kings, this is not unreasonable. Uh, the Egyptians often cut tunnels through solid rock. Uh, they would have major chambers at points in these tunnels, and they would often have secondary tunnels radiating outwards with their own chambers on or along them. None of that is unusual for Egyptian excavations. What is unusual is the scale of the construction. I'm not aware of cases where Egyptians built hundreds of rooms underground, so this would be a very impressive building project. The recent finds include articles which have never been known as native to this country, and doubtless they had their origin in the Orient. War weapons, copper instruments, sharp-edged and hard as steel indicate the high state of civilization reached by these strange people. So interested have the scientists become that preparations are being made to equip the camp for extensive studies, and the force will be increased to 30 or 40 persons. So the site is so large that the Smithsonian is planning to send 30 to 40 people to study it, and they've already found artifacts that are not typical of Native American culture, such as bladed weapons made of something as hard as steel, indicating a developed level of metallurgy and suggesting an origin apart from the Native American cultures. And in addition to the size of the site, they also faced some challenges exploring it. Before going further into the cavern, better facilities for lighting will have to be installed, for the darkness is dense and quite impenetrable for the average flashlight. In order to avoid being lost, wires are being strung from the entrance to all passageways leading directly to large chambers. How far this cavern extends, no one can guess, but it is now the belief of many that what has already been explored is merely the barracks, to use an American term, for the soldiers, and that far into the underworld will be found the main communal dwellings of the families. The perfect ventilation of the cavern, the steady draft that blows through, indicates that it has another outlet to the surface. So they thought that the part of the site that had already been explored was just the soldiers' quarters, but that deeper in the site would be the family quarters, which would have been protected by the soldiers. 
And there seemed to be another entrance that they might be able to find and use, since there was fresh air blowing down from the surface. The article now turned to a report by G.E. Kincaid, the man who discovered the location. Mr. Kincaid's report. Mr. Kincaid was the first white child born in Idaho and has been an explorer and hunter all his life, 30 years having been in the service of the Smithsonian Institute. Even briefly recounted, his history of his discovery sounds fabulous, almost grotesque. Quote, first, I would impress that the cavern is nearly inaccessible. The entrance is 1,486 feet down the sheer canyon wall. It is located on government land, and no visitor will be allowed there under penalty of trespass. The scientists wish to work unmolested without fear of the archaeological discoveries being disturbed by curio or relic hunters. A trip there would be fruitless, and the visitor would be sent on his way. The story of how I found the cavern has been related, but in a paragraph, I was journeying down the Colorado River in a boat, alone, looking for mineral. Some 42 miles up the river from the El Tovar Crystal Canyon, I saw on the east wall stains in the sedimentary formation about 2,000 feet above the riverbed. There was no trail to this point, but I finally reached it with great difficulty. Above a shelf which hid it from view from the river was the mouth of the cave. There are steps leading from this entrance some 30 yards to what was, at the time, the cavern was inhabited, the level of the river. When I saw the chisel marks on the wall inside the entrance, I became interested, securing my gun, and went in. During that trip, I went back several hundred feet along the main passage till I came to the crypt in which I discovered the mummies. One of these I stood up and photographed by flashlight. I gathered a number of relics which I carried down the Colorado to Yuma, from whence I shipped them to Washington with details of the discovery. Following this, the explorations were undertaken. So Mr. Kincaid was traveling down the Colorado River when he saw a discolored patch high up on the canyon wall. This was almost 1,500 feet up from the current river level, but it had apparently been at river level in the distant past. So the river is much lower now than it was then. Kincaid managed to get up to the site, and inside it he found mummies, one of which he photographed. He also took artifacts with him to Yuma, he sent these to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, and they piqued the Smithsonian's interest so much that they began conducting explorations at the site. The Passages The main passageway is about 12 feet wide, narrowing to 9 feet toward the farther end. About 57 feet from the entrance, the first side passages branch off to the right and left, along which, on both sides, are a number of rooms about the size of ordinary living rooms of today, though some are 30 by 40 feet square. These are entered by oval-shaped doors and are ventilated by round air spaces through the walls into the passages. The walls are about 3 feet 6 inches in thickness. The passages are chiseled or hewn as straight as could be laid out by an engineer. The ceilings of many of the rooms converge to a center. The side passages near the entrance run at a sharp angle from the main hall, but toward the rear they gradually reach a right angle in direction. And there have been diagrams of this made by more recent individuals, where you can see the branching of the corridors and the major chambers of the site. But what was particularly interesting is what they found within one of them. The Shrine. Over a hundred feet from the entrance is the Cross Hall, several hundred feet long, in which are found the idol or image of the people's god, sitting cross-legged, with lotus flower or lily in each hand. The cast of the face is oriental, the carving shows a skillful hand, and the entire is remarkably well-preserved, as is everything in this cavern. The idol almost resembles Buddha, though the scientists are not certain as to what religious worship it represents. Taking into consideration everything found thus far, it is possible that this worship most resembles the ancient people of Tibet. Surrounding this idol are smaller images, some very beautiful in form, others crooked-necked and distorted shapes, Symbolical, probably, of good and evil. There are two large cactus with protruding arms, one on each side of the dais on which the god squats. All this is carved out of hard rock resembling marble. Of course, we've all seen Buddha statues, uh, some of which are Tibetan and made of marble or other stone, and they may indeed be depicted holding lotus flowers. The lotus is a water plant that grows in Asia, and it's considered sacred in Hinduism and Buddhism, where it symbolizes the path to enlightenment. 
Although we normally associate the lotus with Asian religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, it was also held sacred in ancient Egypt, where it appears in Egyptian artwork. So here we have a bit of a conundrum. The Smithsonian reportedly found what looked like Egyptian artifacts in the cave, but they also found a statue that looked like a Tibetan Buddha. And the statue was holding a lotus flower that could point either to Asia or Egypt. They also found a lot of metal artifacts. In the opposite corner of this cross hall were found tools of all descriptions made of copper. These people undoubtedly knew the lost art of hardening this metal, which has been sought by chemists for centuries without result. On a bench running around the workroom was some charcoal and other material probably used in the process. There was also slag and stuff similar to mat, showing that these ancient smelted ores, but so far, no trace of where or how this was done has been discovered, nor the origin of the ore. Among the other finds are vases or urns and cups of copper and gold made very artistic in design. The pottery work includes enameled ware and glazed vessels. So the people were thought to have a substantial knowledge of metallurgy as they knew the secret to hardening copper. They also produced glazed pottery, and in addition to these artifacts, the explorers also discovered what they ate to sustain themselves. Another passageway leads to granaries, such as are found in the Oriental temples. They contain seeds of various kinds. One very large storehouse has not yet been entered, as it is 12 feet high and can be reached only from above. Two copper hooks extend on the edge, which indicates that some sort of ladder was attached. These granaries are rounded, as the materials of which they are constructed, I think is a very hard cement. A gray metal is also found in this cavern, which puzzles the scientists, for its identity has not been established. It resembles platinum. Strewn promiscuously over the floor everywhere are what people call cat's eyes, a yellow stone of no great value. Each one is engraved with the head of the melee type. So the people who built this complex may have known how to make cement, and a kind of cement was known by the ancient Egyptians. They also had a gray metal that Kincaid thought resembled platinum, but that hardly proves anything since almost all metals are gray and resemble platinum. And they had yellow stones popularly called cat's eyes. In gemology, cat's eyes can be a number of different types of minerals, but the term especially refers to chrysoberyl, which can be cut in a way that it often has a streak of light across it resembling the slit in a cat's eye, hence the name. But these cat's eyes had been cut in the form of human heads, which Kincaid thought resembled Malaysian ones, again indicating a link or suggesting a link to East Asia rather than Egypt. The hieroglyphics. On all the urns or walls over doorways and tablets of stone, which were found by the image, are the mysterious hieroglyphics, the key to which the Smithsonian Institute hopes yet to discover. The engraving on the tablets probably has something to do with the religion of the people. Similar hieroglyphics have been found in southern Arizona. Among the pictorial writings, only two animals are found. One is of prehistoric type. I wish they described the prehistoric animal they found an illustration of. There used to be a lot of animals that lived in North America, including in human times, that are now extinct, including the so-called megafauna, or really large animals. And it would be fascinating to know what animal this picture illustrated. The crypt. The tomb, or crypt, in which the mummies are found is one of the largest of the chambers, the walls slanting back at an angle of about 35 degrees. On these are tiers of mummies, each one occupying a separate hewn shelf. At the head of each is a small bench, on which is found copper cups and pieces of broken swords. Some of the mummies are covered with clay, and all are wrapped in a bark fabric. The urns or cups on the lower tiers are crude, while as the higher shelves are reached, the urns are finer in design, showing a later stage of civilization. It is worthy of note that all the mummies examined so far have proved to be male, no children or females being buried here. This leads to the belief that this exterior section was the warrior's barracks. The fact the mummies were all male is interesting, and it could be explained by these being warrior's barracks, especially given the pieces of broken swords that they found. Now, people associate mummies with ancient Egypt, and we talked about Egyptian mummies back in episode 241, where I interviewed Egyptologist Dr. Bob Breyer. Uh, listeners can go to mysterious.fm slash 241 to hear that episode. Uh, 
But mummification is practiced in other cultures, and it can even occur naturally. These mummies, the article says, were different from Egyptian ones. Some were covered in clay, which actually is similar to the way some early Egyptian mummies were covered in plaster. But they were also wrapped in fabric made from bark, which is not typical of Egypt. Since they have very few trees there and wood is scarce, they don't really have a lot of bark. Bark is used instead as a material much more by Native American cultures. However, animal bones and skins are also prominent materials in Native American cultures, and they didn't find any of those, which is actually rather surprising. Among the discoveries, no bones of animals have been found, no skins, no clothing, no bedding. Many of the rooms are bare, but for water vessels. One room, about 40 by 700 feet, was probably the main dining hall, for cooking utensils are found here. What these people lived on is a problem, though it is presumed that they came south in the winter and farmed in the valleys, going back north in the summer. Upwards of 50,000 people could have lived in the caverns comfortably. One theory is that the present Indian tribes found in Arizona are descendants of the serfs or slaves of the people which inhabited the cave. Undoubtedly, a good many thousands of years before the Christian era, a people lived here which reached a high stage of civilization. The chronology of human history is full of gaps. Professor Jordan is much enthused over the discoveries and believes that the find will prove of incalculable value in archaeological work. The idea that 50,000 people could have lived in the underground site is really remarkable. But then we've been describing the location as being really massive in its proportions. When it comes to the idea that the Native Americans of Arizona had been the serfs or slaves of the people who built the complex, this is apparently based on the fact that they perceived the site builders as having a higher level of technology than the tribes in Arizona, and so they must have been built by a more technologically advanced people who then vanished. But this kind of argumentation has fallen on hard times because it ties individual groups of people to levels of technological development, as if some peoples produce more advanced tech for intrinsic reasons, which is actually a racist idea. The reality is that levels of technological development fluctuate over time. You can build them up with time, getting more advanced tech, but you can also have setbacks like wars and famines and plagues and natural disasters that can knock your technological level back down. So there's no intrinsic connection between a group of people and a level of technological development. And you don't need to postulate a vanished higher tech race. Uh, there could just have been some kind of setback. However, passing on from that point, Kincaid describes one chamber that they hadn't yet explored. One thing I have not spoken of may be of interest. There is one chamber, the passageway to which is not ventilated, and when we approached it, a deadly, snaky smell struck us. Our light would not penetrate the gloom, and until stronger ones are available, we will not know what the chamber contains. Some say snakes, but others boo-hoo this idea and think it may contain a deadly gas or chemicals used by the ancients. No sounds are heard, but it smells snaky just the same. The whole underground installation gives one of shaky nerves the creeps. The gloom is like a weight on one's shoulders, and our flashlights and candles only make the darkness blacker. Imagination can revel in conjectures and ungodly daydreams back through the ages that have elapsed till the mind reels dizzily in space. I find it interesting that Kincaid would know what snakes smell like. I confess that... I haven't spent a lot of time in herpetological or ophiological centers, and I have an impression that snakes do have a distinctive smell when you get a bunch of snakes or other reptiles together, but I wouldn't be able to recognize and name the scent the way that Kincaid did, not without seeing snakes to tell me what I'm smelling. And an individual snake doesn't produce much of an odor in my experience, but Clark Stanley's snake oil was a popular patent medicine at the time, so maybe Kincaid had used a bottle of snake oil and was basing his recognition of the smell on that. The Gazette story then finishes by relating some material that isn't in Kincaid's voice. An Indian legend. In connection with this story, it is notable that among the Hopi Indians, the tradition is told that their ancestors once lived in an underworld in the Grand Canyon till dissension arose between the good and the bad, 
the people of one heart and people of two hearts. Machetto, who was their chief, counseled them to leave the underworld, but there was no way out. The chief then caused a tree to grow up and pierce the roof of the underworld, and then the people of one heart climbed out. They tarried by Paisisvai, Red River, which is the Colorado, and grew grain and corn. They sent out a message to the Temple of the Sun, asking the blessing of peace, goodwill, and rain for people of one heart. That messenger never returned, but today at the Hopai villages at sundown can be seen the old men of the tribe out on the housetops, gazing toward the sun, looking for the messenger. When he returns, their lands and ancient dwelling place will be restored to them. That is the tradition. Among the engravings of animals in the cave is seen the image of a heart over the spot where it is located. The legend was learned by W. E. Rollins, the artist, during a year spent with the Hopi Indians. There are two theories of the origin of the Egyptians. One is that they came from Asia. Another, that the racial cradle was in the Upper Nile region. Arnold Heeren, an Egyptologist, believed in the Indian origin of the Egyptians. The discoveries in the Grand Canyon may throw further light on human evolution and prehistoric ages. And Heeren was actually a classicist rather than an Egyptologist, and hieroglyphs weren't deciphered until he was an old man. But he may have believed that the Egyptians came from India. Uh, today, no Egyptologist believes that, and we have evidence for independent civilizations in both Egypt and in India, and neither came from the other. In fact, if you go back far enough, the people who ended up in India would have, been, would have migrated from Africa, most likely going through Egypt, just like everybody who isn't of African descent, but they wouldn't have been Indians yet. Indian Indians. Anyway, that's the end of the story, and that's basically all that's been reported about Kincaid's cave. So the story was largely forgotten until the 1990s when it was rediscovered. I remember hearing about it on Coast to Coast AM, the late night radio show that Art Bell founded. And since this fabulous discovery has never been widely publicized, it was already being claimed back in the 90s that the Smithsonian Institution was suppressing knowledge of it. And it was a grand archaeological cover-up. So that's what we're going to talk about next. And we'd like to take a moment right now to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Laura M., John, Mary Claire L., Don G., and Jordan S. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com and by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. So what can we say about Kincaid's Cave from the Reason Perspective? You said that some think the lack of ongoing news about these finds is evidence of a cover-up by the Smithsonian Institution. Who says that? One individual is named David Hatcher Childress, who helped repopularize the story in the 1990s. And in 1993, he wrote an article called Archaeological Cover-Ups for Nexus Magazine. In it, he wrote... The cover-up and alleged suppression of archaeological evidence began in late 1881 when John Wesley Powell, the geologist famous for exploring the Grand Canyon, appointed Cyrus Thomas as the director of the Eastern Mound Division of the Smithsonian Institution's Bureau of Ethnology. When Thomas came to the Bureau of Ethnology, he was a pronounced believer in the existence of a race of mound builders distinct from the American Indians. However, John Wesley Powell, the director of the Bureau of Ethnology, a very sympathetic man toward the American Indians, had lived with the peaceful Winnebago Indians of Wisconsin for many years as a youth and felt that American Indians were unfairly thought of as primitive and savage. I should explain about the Mound Builders. Uh, this is a collective name that's applied to several different groups of pre-Columbian people in North America because they, well, built mounds. 
big mounds that attracted attention of archaeologists. And some of them have interesting structures that you can dig down through to learn about earlier structures on the same site, like the tells in the Middle East, which are artificial mounds that built up over time as people rebuilt on top of an older settlement. For example, in Israel, Megiddo, or Armageddon, is a tell. The different mount building cultures in North America were active in the Great Lakes region, the Ohio River Valley, and in the Mississippi River Valley. The oldest of them started building their mounds around 3500 BC, and other cultures continued the practice down to the AD 1500s, which was after European contact. Today, they are recognized as all being Native American cultures, and some of the tribes that used to build mounds are known. But in the 19th century, there was a debate about the mound builders. It was thought, again based on the racist idea of linking races and technology too closely, that Native Americans couldn't have built such massive, impressive structures, so they must have been built by another, more advanced people that had since vanished. Suggestions included the Danes as part of Viking settlements in North America, the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel, who we talked about way back in episode 14, so you can go to mysterious.fm slash 14 to hear that, and another suggestion was people from Atlantis, which we'll talk about in the future. So Childress is arguing that Cyrus Thomas was a problematic guy to put in charge of the Smithsonian's Eastern Mound Division in its Bureau of Ethnology because he had this couldn't-be-Native-Americans-slash-must-be-a-lost-vanish-race view. But after studying the mound builders closely, Thomas came to reject that view, and he critiqued the arguments used in favor of it. Childress seems to attribute that change, perhaps in part, to the influence of his Indian-friendly boss, John Wesley Powell. The Smithsonian began to promote the idea that Native Americans, at that time being exterminated in the Indian Wars, were descended from advanced civilizations and were worthy of respect and protection. They also began a program of suppressing any archaeological evidence that lent credence to the school of thought known as diffusionism, a school which believes that throughout history there has been widespread dispersion of culture and civilization via contact by ship and major trade routes. The Smithsonian opted for the opposite school, known as isolationism. Isolationism holds that most civilizations are isolated from each other and that there has been very little contact between them, especially those that are separated by bodies of water. In this intellectual war that started in the 1880s, it was held that even contact between the civilizations of the Ohio and Mississippi valleys were rare, and certainly these civilizations did not have any contact with such advanced cultures as the Mayas, Toltecs, or Aztecs in Mexico and Central America. By old world standards, this is an extreme and even ridiculous idea considering that the river system reached to the Gulf of Mexico and these civilizations were as close as the opposite shore of the Gulf. It was like saying that cultures in the Black Sea area could not have had contact with the Mediterranean. So according to Childress, the Smithsonian adopted a narrative where people didn't have much long-distance contact, and that would go against the idea that there could be Egyptian or Tibetan artifacts in the Grand Canyon. So Childress writes, Is the Smithsonian Institution covering up an archaeological discovery of immense importance? If this story is true, it would radically change the current view that there was no transoceanic contact in pre-Columbian times, and that all American Indians on both continents are descended from Ice Age explorers who came across the Bering Strait. He also offers the following argument. Historian and linguist Carl Hart, editor of my organization's magazine, World Explorer, obtained a hiker's map of the Grand Canyon from a bookstore in Chicago. Poring over the map, we were amazed to see that much of the area on the north side of the canyon has Egyptian names. The area around 94 Mile Creek and Trinity Creek had areas, rock formations apparently, with names like Tower of Set, Tower of Ra, Horus Temple, Osiris Temple, and Isis Temple. In the Haunted Canyon area were such names as the Cheops Pyramid, the Buddha Cloister, Buddha Temple, Manu Temple, and Shiva Temple. Was there any relationship between these places and the alleged Egyptian discoveries in the Grand Canyon? 
So there are a bunch of places around the Grand Canyon with Egyptian and Hindu-inspired names, and Childress wonders if these place names could have any connection with the discovery of Kincaid's cave. What do you make of this argument? I think it's a very weak one. Uh, first, to, to his credit, Childress tried to check out the basis of the argument. We called a state archaeologist at the Grand Canyon and were told that the early explorers had just liked Egyptian and Hindu names, but that it was true that this area was off limits to hikers or other visitors, quote, because of dangerous caves, end quote. Indeed, this entire area with the Egyptian and Hindu place names in the Grand Canyon is a forbidden zone. No one is allowed into this large area. Childress tries to make it sound like this could be part of the cover-up, but there's an easy way to check whether these names are coincidental or not. So I did that. And I looked up whether these names were being used before Kincaid's reported discovery of the cave in 1909. Well, the Tower of Ra received its name from the U.S. Board of Geographical Names in 1906, three years earlier. So did the Isis Temple. It was also named in 1906. And the Tower of Set got its name way back in 1879. And we know who inspired the naming convention. It was geologist Clarence Dutton, who surveyed the Grand Canyon and started giving famous formations mythological names. So this argument is based on pure coincidence. Setting aside the naming argument, what do you make of Childress's insinuation of a cover-up on the part of the Smithsonian? It would rest on the idea that the Smithsonian was highly motivated, starting in 1909 or shortly thereafter, to suppress the idea of contact with the old world in favor of the theory that Native Americans used to have more technologically advanced cultures. And by technologically advanced, I don't mean 21st century level technology, just knowledge of metallurgy and things like that. But it's really hard to see them, the Smithsonian, being fanatical on the subject, you know, fanatical enough to flat out lie about finding Egyptian or Asian artifacts. I mean, heck, the standard theory about the origin of Native Americans is that their ancestors migra migrated over from Asia on the Bering Strait land bridge. So finding early Asian artifacts wouldn't conflict with that narrative. And there were already claims of contact with Europeans like Viking settlements in North America, claims that have since been verified. So contact with Egyptians crossing the Atlantic wouldn't be impossible, or Tibetans crossing the Pacific. It's just really hard for me to imagine the Smithsonian having artifacts from old world civilizations in hand, you know, from Arizona, and then deliberately suppressing them. Now, why would they do that? What if we don't chalk this up to conspiracy, but just to incompetence? Could the Smithsonian have simply lost the artifacts, and that's why the story didn't go anywhere after 1909? Well, um, incompetence always needs to be considered. It's frequently a much better explanation than malice or conspiracy. And the Smithsonian has apparently received artifacts and then lost track of them. But if that were the case we should be able to verify the substance of the newspaper story another way. We should be able to confirm various things that it says. And so I started checking that out. And what did you discover? Well, for a start, the article has no byline. It's completely anonymous. That's not impossible for a truthful story, since newspapers didn't always use bylines back then, but it is a little suspicious. In favor of the article, I can name the following facts. First, two of the individuals the story mentions, W.E. Rollins, the artist, and Arnold Heeren, the classicist, are real people. But that doesn't count for much because neither is involved in the story. They're not part of the Smithsonian expedition. They're just well-known cultural reference points that the story mentions, but that don't have anything to do with the Grand Canyon expedition. Uh, second, the story was preceded three weeks earlier by the brief story we read about G.E. Kincaid completing his trip down the Colorado. That is more significance. But if this is a hoax, it could be a setup for the second story that would appear three weeks later. So the announcement of the amazing discovery wouldn't come out of the blue. That way people would remember reading the first story and it would give the second story more credibility. So I think this fact is ambiguous, but it tends to lean in favor of the story being real. 
Thirdly, and finally, the second story was on the front page, and you'd think that the editor believed the story if he's putting it on the first page. Uh, Newspapers at the time did run joke or hoax stories. Uh, We talked about that in episode 279, and again a week later in episode 280 on the mystery airships of 1896 and 1897. You can listen to those by going to mysterious.fm slash 279 and mysterious.fm slash 280. But newspapers didn't put joke or hoax stories on the front page. Could the editor of the Gazette have really believed the story, even if it was a hoax? It's certainly possible. Uh, It appears that the story was prompted by G.E. Kincaid. He was visiting Phoenix the day before the story appeared, and he told the story to the Gazette. So if Kincaid was a hoaxer, he may have just told the reporter a tall tale that was convincing enough that the editor took it seriously and put it on the front page. In our episodes on the 1897 airships, you were able to go through newspaper articles and verify that the multiple people named as witnesses were real individuals, including prominent individuals who could sue the paper for misrepresenting them if this were a hoax. Has that technique been applied here? There are only two individuals named in the story as being involved with the Smithsonian's uh, expedition, G.E. Kincaid and Professor S.A. Jordan. Kincaid reportedly worked for the Smithsonian for 30 years, and Jordan also worked for it and was prestigious enough to head the expedition. He's also a professor, which would make it possible to identify him through university records, since professors teach at universities. At a minimum, both of them should be found in the Smithsonian's employee or contractor records, as well as many other documents like the university records. Well, in the year 2000, a man named Peter Hay from the paranormal Fox TV show Sightings contacted the Smithsonian about this, and here's what they told him. Peter Hay, your email of January 11 has been received. The Smithsonian Institution has received many questions about an article in the April 5, 1909 Phoenix Gazette about G.E. Kincaid and his discovery of a great underground citadel in the Grand Canyon hewn by an ancient race of oriental origin, possibly from Egypt. According to the article, Professor Jordan directed a major investigation of the citadel that was mounted by the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian's Department of Anthropology has searched its files without finding any mention of a Professor Jordan, Kincaid, or a lost Egyptian civilization in Arizona. Nevertheless, the story continues to be repeated in books and articles. We appreciate your interest in the Smithsonian Institution. So the Smithsonian denies having any record of Jordan, Kincaid, or a supposed find of Egyptian artifacts in Arizona. Now, you could say, it's all part of the cover-up, which would be a little hard to believe, especially at this late date, when it's widely acknowledged that there was contact between the old world and the new world in pre-Columbian times. But various researchers have gone looking for for records of Jordan and Kincaid, anything that would verify their existence as real individuals, and so far they have found nothing. There are no records of either Professor S.A. Jordan or Mr. G.E. Kincaid as real individuals. Kincaid is mentioned only in the two Gazette stories, and Jordan is only mentioned in the second story. Other than that, there is no paper trail on either of these individuals, and there should be for both of them and especially for a professor working for the Smithsonian like Jordan. He should be mentioned in other institutions' records. Back in 1909, it would have been easier to check out the story. If there was an archaeological expedition going on at the Grand Canyon, all you'd have to do is go to the people in charge of the park and ask how to contact its members. Did anybody think to do that? Yes, they did. Um, Now, Phoenix is about 230 miles south of the Grand Canyon, but Flagstaff is much closer. It's only 80 miles south of the canyon. So after the Phoenix Gazette ran its story on April 5th, a newspaper in Flagstaff decided it didn't want to miss out on a good local story. And so the paper, the Coconino Sun, did some checking. And they ran the following short piece on Friday, April 16th on their front page. Looks like a Mulhattan story. 
The reported discovery of a mammoth underground city of an ancient race in the Grand Canyon seems to be a splendid piece of imagination sent out by some Mulhattanized individual. At least no one in this section of Arizona knows anything of it, and it would be just possible that somebody at the Grand Canyon would have been informed of it if an actual discovery had been made. The man who wrote up the find certainly had to dig for some of the details and was wise in locating the entrance at a point on a sheer wall where no one but a person with a great imagination could reach it. So the Coconino Sun checked with the people at the Grand Canyon, and none of the officials there knew about the supposed amazing discovery, which they would have known about if there had been such a gobsmacking discovery and a Smithsonian expedition was in process of investigating it. This challenge, coming just 11 days after the Gazette story, and thus back when the story was easy to check out, is a serious blow to its credibility. Between that and the fact that nothing else was ever announced about the find, nothing, this is looking more and more like a hoax, even if it was a hoax played on the reporter and editor of the Gazette by someone pretending to be G.E. Kincaid. The Coconino Sun said that this looks like a Mulhattan story and that it seems to be a splendid piece of imagination sent out by some Mulhattanized individual. What are they talking about? This brings us to one of the most successful hoaxers in American history, which is why I wanted to do this story for our April Fool's episode this year. The individual in question was a man named Joseph Mulhattan. The Museum of Hoaxes has a page on him, and it says... During the 1870s and 1880s, Joseph Mulhattan was perhaps the most famous hoaxer in America. He was a traveling salesman, not a reporter, but he was notorious for repeatedly succeeding in having his far-fetched tales reported as news. If an outrageous or bizarre story appeared in the papers, reporters would often assume it was the work of Mulhattan. The media showered him with epithets. They called him a professional liar, the author of more hoaxes than any other man living. Munchausen Malhattan, and the Liar Laureate of the World. He was also widely known by his pseudonym, Orange Blossom. Malhattan made nothing from his tales. He concocted them purely for the thrill of deceiving the media. He would send his stories to newspaper offices, and editors would usually accept them without question. Many editors probably realized that the stories were false, but printed them anyway, knowing that they were amusing and would boost circulation. An article about Manhattan in the Syracuse Sunday Herald, December 1900, stated, He never made a cent by his lies, and in ordinary business affairs he spoke the truth. But he had a mania for giving misinformation to the newspaper and indulged himself in the mania to the injury of his other business. Manhattan himself claimed his hoaxes were a journalistic innovation, which he called novelistic journalism. He compared planting a false story in a newspaper to writing a novel in a thousand words but he boasted that his novels were read by a million people 10 hours after he had written them. He said in an 1883 interview, Nobody's hurt by my little novels, nobody's morals are corrupted, and all are entertained and sometimes instructed. During the early 1880s, a reporter provided this description of his physical appearance. The famous prevaricator is a rather small man, good-looking with beard and mustache, dancing blue eyes, quick cat-like motions, and one of the most rapid talkers one could find in a day's walk. The words seem to be gurgling in his throat and chasing each other out, hot-footed. He dresses very well and altogether presents a very tidy appearance. After graduating from high school, Mulhattan left the Pittsburgh area and became a highly successful traveling salesman, also known as a commercial drummer. He traveled the country, representing businesses such as the Kentucky Jeans Company, W.B. Belknap & Company, Hart & Company, and Rankin's Snyder Hardware Company of Louisville. However, even as his business career flourished, he continued his side career as a hoaxer. Mulhattan was the son of a Presbyterian minister. He was born in a small town outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1853, and he apparently was quite a personable fellow, including among his fellow salesmen, or drummers as they were known. In 1884, the Drummers National Convention nominated him for President of the United States, and although he had an army of salesmen to theoretically stump for him, he ended up losing the 1884 election to President Grover Cleveland. Unfortunately, things 
then went downhill for Joe Mulhatton. The Museum of Hoaxes reports, By the late 1880s, his drinking had become a serious problem. In 1891, papers reported that he had been placed in a Chicago detention hospital for the insane. Mulhatton claimed he was suffering mental problems as a result of a head injury sustained by falling from a streetcar in New Orleans. However, it later was reported that the detention hospital was actually an inebriate asylum. Two months later, there were reports he had moved to Pittsburgh, where he was arrested for stealing money from a man he had met in a saloon. The papers reported that he denied taking the money, but the amount said to have been taken was found in his possession. In December 1902, a Louisville, Kentucky newspaper reported he had been found lying in the rain in front of the Falls City Hotel. At first, it was thought he was dead, but it turned out he was drunk. In 1904, reports placed him in a San Francisco police station, awaiting trial for the theft of an overcoat. The reporter, J.H. Rafferty, visited him in jail and wrote, This outcast, ragged, stuttering, downcast man is the same Joseph Mulhattan who ten years ago was the richest, most popular, and best commercial traveler in the United States. The purple and fine linen of his heyday are changed to noisome, smelly rags. He sits on a rickety bench, his smeared face in his dirty hands, his bleary eyes staring at the mud-daubed shoes in which he has been tramping the streets and alleys of San Francisco. His nose is red and shriveled, his face and body bloated, his limbs dwindled and shaky, his hands like talons. The San Francisco Call also ran an illustration of Mulhattan as he now appeared standing next to his former self. Formerly, he had been a distinguished-looking businessman in a snappy suit and top hat with a neatly trimmed mustache and goatee. But now he had gained a lot of weight. He was wearing a shabby, ill-fitting suit and had unshaven cheeks with a much less proper mustache and goatee. Mulhattan eventually went to his reward— On Monday, December 13th, 1913, four years after the story of Kincaid's cave appeared, the Arizona Republican carried this notice. Gila Swallows Joe Melhattan, well-known mining man and entertainer for a generation of newspaper readers of country, drowned near Kelvin, Arizona. Joseph Melhattan, a well-known mining man, was drowned in the Gila River near Kelvin on Friday evening. The news of his death reached Phoenix yesterday morning in a telegram to the Republican from his sister, Mrs. Helena M. Leslie of New York. A telephone message from Kelvin last night stated that the death of Mr. Mulhattan occurred around 5 o'clock on Friday evening. He had been in town and started on foot across the river to his camp. The river was swollen, and soon after he entered the water, he was swept from his feet and carried down. The body was recovered that evening and was buried in the cemetery at Kelvin. And thus, Joseph Mulhattan passed into the great beyond, leaving a great legacy of hoaxes behind him. He spun some really fantastic yarns. For example, here's an account of one of his earlier hoaxes. It appeared in 1877 in the Pontiac Commercial of Pontiac, Michigan, which published the following story. Washington Petrified. Washington Correspondence of the San Francisco Chronicle. We visited Washington's tomb today at Mount Vernon, Virginia, some 12 miles from the city, down the Potomac, and we had the unusual privilege of beholding the mortal remains of the immortal Washington. Visitors to the tomb will remember that the west wall of the same has, for several years, been in a falling condition and in great need of repair. A few days since, part of it tumbled into the tomb, completely covering the sarcophagus of Washington and also that of Martha Washington. In order to repair the damage in a competent manner, it was found necessary to remove them a few feet from their resting place. The one containing the remains of Martha Washington was removed first but attracted no attention. But the unusual weight of the one containing the remains of Washington aroused the curiosity of the official who was superintending the work of removal, and it was decided to open the sarcophagus in order to ascertain the cause. This was done, and the remains were found to be petrified. In fact, a solid stone resembling a statue, the features perfectly natural with the exception of eyes and ears, no trace of which can be seen. The body is of a dark leathery color and may be said to be a soft sandstone which would likely break should an attempt be made to remove it from the sarcophagus. Edward Baker, an aged colored man who has resided upon the farm since he was a boy and who assisted in removing the remains from the old tomb to the present one, informed us that it is 38 years since their last removal. 
At that time, they had rested in the old tomb 38 years and were exhumed in a state of preservation beyond all expectation, being a solid compact mass, with the skin drawn tightly to the bones, petrification no doubt having commenced its work. The repairs to the tomb will be completed today, and the sarcophagus is not likely to be opened again for a century to come, unless indeed in the case of an accident, as in the present instance, and petrifaction will complete its work, and the remains of the immortal Washington will then be as enduring as his memory is dear. So, yeah, the remains of George Washington have turned to stone. Another of Mulhattan's hoaxes was published in 1883 in the Chicago Tribune. The Tribune recognized it was a hoax by Mulhattan and warned the readers of this, but they still printed it. Fort Worth, Texas, April 15th. A dispatch from Williams Ranch says, About two o'clock this morning, a great meteor fell in the outskirts of the town, killing several heads of cattle and destroying the dwelling house of Martinez Garcia, a Mexican herdsman who, with his family, consisting of his wife and five children, is buried beneath the ruins. In its descent, the meteor resembled a massive ball of fire, and the shock was similar to that of an earthquake. It is still hot and steaming. It is embedded in the earth probably 100 feet, and towers above the surface about 70 feet, and will cover about one acre of ground. The concussion was terrific, nearly every window in town being shattered. People were hurled violently from their beds, and goods and storehouses thrown from the shelves. No lives were lost, as far as known, except the Mexican herdsmen and family, although several buildings fell to the ground. Cattle fled in terror in every direction. The air was filled with sulfurous gas. The wildest confusion prevailed, as it was a long time before anybody could even conjecture what it was. This is the largest meteor which has ever fallen, and has already been visited by many people, and will doubtless continue to attract great attention for months to come. It occasioned great excitement, not only here, but all over the surrounding country. This is physically impossible. If a meteor struck the Earth that was still 130 feet tall on impact, it would have created a massive impact crater and caused much more destruction than the story says. And then there's this, which is my favorite Manhattan hoax, at least so far. In 1899, the Arizona Republic ran a piece that stated... Joe Mulhattan was in Florence last week from the Ripsy country, where he has recently discovered a magnetic cactus, which from his account must be a wonderful species of vegetation. Its attractive powers are so great that it draws birds and animals to it and impales them on its thorny spikes. Mr. Mulhattan approached no nearer than 100 feet to the cactus, which is of the saguaro variety, yet at that distance it was all he could do to resist its influence to draw him to it. While in town, he purchased a long rope, which he will tie around his body, and four of his friends will take hold of it and allow him to approach near enough to minutely examine the wonder without danger. Mr. Melhotten, who is one of our most truthful citizens, promises an accurate description of his recent find for publication in the Florence Tribune. And, ever true to his word, Melhotten did send a follow-up report, and a week later, the paper carried this piece. The Magnetic Cactus the Tribune is in receipt of additional particulars in regard to the wonderful magnetic cactus recently discovered in Ripsy Country. The following letter will fully explain itself. Dagger Well, near Ripsy Mine, February 9, 1989. Editor, Florence Tribune. The magnetic cactus you wrote about in last week's Tribune is a species of the giant saguara. It is found in many places between Casa Grande and Florence, between Florence and Mesa, and between Florence and Riverside. There is a belt of earth within a radius of 50 miles of Florence that is very magnetic, no doubt caused by vast beds of copper or some other magnetic material that underlies it all. And this species of cactus, from its fibrous nature, acts like a telegraph instrument to receive and discharge the earth's vast surplus of magnetism, not required by the moon's and sun's magnetic attraction. All the magnetic cacti in this neighborhood are either positive or negative. One attracts, the other repels. Two tramps passing along the road just above Donnelly's a few nights ago took refuge under a bunch of this cactus. One of the men was at once drawn up to and impaled on the sharp blades of the cactus, while its octopus-like arms folded around him, crushing him through and into the cactus, where his blood, flesh, and bones turned into a pulp very much like 
ordinary mucilage, which trickled out slowly from the aperture made by the passing in of the man's body. The cactus loses its magnetic power while it is digesting its victims, so we were enabled to look at this wonderful yet gruesome sight and report these particulars. Our party, consisting of some of the best-known and most responsible citizens of Pinal County, James Elder, a well-known mining man of Riverside, Clay Hockett, now of Florence, A.F. Barker, W.Y. Price, ex-District Attorney Sniffen, William Truman, John Keating, George Truman, Tom Payon, Pete Brady, and Lem Dreas. The body of the other tramp was repelled by the negative cactus and thrown about 100 feet distance against a positive cactus, where it underwent a similar process to the one just described. We left the sickening scene with sad hearts and with nothing to identify the victims. After and just before a great storm, the attractive and repellent power of the cactus is indescribable. Calves, birds, and young colts are attracted, impaled, drawn in, and quickly converted by the digestive juices of the cactus into thick, mucilaginous substance just described. There is very little travel through this wild section of Arizona, or this species of cacti would have been written about sooner. Yours truly, Joe Melhattan. So, that's the story of Melhattan's discovery of the amazing magnetic cactus. So, we've established that Joseph Mulhattan was a notorious hoaxer of the time, but is there any evidence that he himself was responsible for the story of Kincaid's cave? The piece from the Flagstaff newspaper we quoted just said it looks like a Mulhattan story, and that it looked like it had been done by a Mulhattanized individual. Could it have been somebody else? Well, it could have been. Uh, the Flagstaff paper didn't have proof it was by Mulhattan. It sounded like his kind of story, but it could have been hoaxed by someone else. However, I think there are several pieces of evidence that do at least point in the direction of Mulhattan himself being responsible. First, you'll notice that in, eight, in the 1899 story of the magnetic cactus that we just heard, Mulhattan was in Florence, Arizona, and this wasn't just a visit. By this period in his life, he was living regularly in Arizona, apparently as a minor. He would remain in Arizona until his death in 1913. So he was there in 1909 when the story of Kincaid's cave was published. And it's possible that he pretended to be Kincaid and hoaxed the reporter from the Phoenix Gazette. Although there's another piece of evidence that the paper may have been in on the hoax, which we'll discuss in a few moments. Second, Mulhattan sometimes executed his hoaxes in more than one phase. For example, we just heard an initial short piece about the magnetic cactus, which was shortly followed by a more elaborate version of the same story. That's basically what happened in the Phoenix Gazette. On March 12th, there was an initial story about G.E. Kincaid completing his trip with bare mentions of interesting archaeological discoveries, but no details. And then on April 5th, there was a story centered on Kincaid and going into great depth about all the details. So this fits a known pattern that Mulhattan sometimes used. Third, Mulhattan had a tendency to reuse elements from earlier hoaxes in later ones. He did more than one George Washington hoax. He did the same thing with other hoaxes. And in 1878, the St. Louis Evening Post carried this story. A wonderful cave. The discovery made by a poor farmer near Glasgow. Subterranean roads 23 miles long and rivers navigable for 14 miles. Special dispatch to the Evening Post. Glasgow, Kentucky, June 22nd. Another wonderful cave has recently been discovered near this town. It has already been explored for a distance of 23 miles in one direction, called the Long Route, and 16 miles in another direction, called the Short Route. The avenues are very wide, and a span of horses could easily be drawn through for a distance of 11 miles. Three rivers, wide and very deep, are encountered in the Long Route. One of them is navigable for 14 miles until the passages become too narrow to admit a boat. This forms the third, or river route, which has to be explored in a boat. The cave is wonderful beyond description and far supersedes in grandeur the Mammoth Cave, or any cave ever before discovered. Several mummified remains have been discovered in one of the large rooms. They were reposing in stone coffins, rudely constructed, 
and from their appearance may have been in this cave for centuries. They present every appearance of Egyptian mummies. Great excitement prevails over this very important discovery. Mr. Edwin Mortimier of Chestnut Street, Louisville, Kentucky, purchased three of the mummies and has them now in his possession. Major George M. Proctor of Glasgow Junction, Kentucky, purchased the remainder of the mummies from the owner of the cave, whose name is Thomas Kelly. He is, or rather was, a few days ago, a very poor man struggling to make a payment on a farm of 24 acres, upon which, by mere accident, the entrance to this wonderful cave was discovered. He realized about $400 from the sale of the mummies, or $12,000 after all the inflation the government has caused, and is now offered $10,000 cash, or $300,000 today, for the cave. The entrance to the cave is within the town limits, and only about two minutes' walk from the depot. The newly discovered cave has been named the Grand Crystal Cave, and it is as beautiful as the word implies. Ladders and bridges are being constructed, and J.R. Puckett, a capitalist of the town, announced his intention of having a small steamboat constructed expressly for the purpose of navigating its wonderful rivers. So we've got a fantastically huge cave, an absolutely enormous one, the biggest ever discovered with multiple branching routes in it. And it's got mummies inside it, and they look like Egyptian mummies. So there's another hint of pre-Columbian contact with ancient Egypt. It looks like after he moved out to Arizona, Mulhattan simply recycled the story he'd initially told in Kentucky, transplanted it to Arizona, and turned it from the biggest cave ever discovered to the greatest archaeological find ever discovered. There's also this. In the earlier story, he said that the cave had been named Grand Crystal Cave, and in the 1909 story, Kincaid said that the underground citadel was 42 miles up the Colorado River from El Tovar Crystal Canyon. Now, here's the thing. There is no such place as El Tovar Crystal Canyon. There is an El Tovar Hotel right on the southern rim of the Grand Canyon, and it's a really swanky place. President Theodore Roosevelt, who had a great affinity for the canyon, stayed there in 1911. So by using the local name El Tovar, it could sound like a real location near the Grand Canyon, but there is no such place as El Tovar Crystal Canyon. However, in the Kentucky Giant Cave story, Mulhattan wrote that it was named Grand Crystal Cave. So maybe he transformed Grand Crystal Cave into El Tovar Crystal Canyon by the Grand Canyon in the process of recycling the story. At least, that's a possibility. Do we have any other evidence that might point to Mulhattan being responsible for the story of Kincaid's Cave? A fourth piece of evidence concerns one of Mulhattan's pen names. He was known for sometimes writing under the name Orange Blossom. Well, it so happens that in an article published by the Grand Canyon Historical Society, researcher Don Lego writes, The Gazette may have been having some extra fun with the Egyptian cave story by placing it right next to an advertisement from a local candy store. The advertisement ran for one week, offering a Phoenix-style Easter gift that could be shipped to friends back east. The gift was orange blossoms waxed to preserve them. In large letters, the ad was headlined, Orange Blossoms. So maybe the Phoenix Gazette was in on the joke after all, and they signaled the in-the-know readers that Orange Blossom, or Joseph Mulhattan, was the author of the story by putting an ad for Orange Blossoms right next to the story on the front page. So Jimmy, what's your bottom line on this story? The story of Kincaid's cave is a fascinating one. It would be really cool to have evidence that there was contact between either Egypt or East Asia and the Native American tribes of Arizona in pre-Columbian times. And we have evidence of pre-Columbian contact with the Old World and the New World, as we'll discuss in future episodes. But the story of Kincaid's cave itself appears to be a hoax. We do not have good evidence that the story is true, and we have a lot of evidence against it. The original 1909 story was likely the product of Joseph Mulhattan's imagination, or the imagination of someone a lot like him, no matter what some modern interpreters say. Joseph Mulhattan himself was a striking individual. He had a fascinating life story with ups and downs, 
but he entertained the people of his day. And all of today's story, as we've related it, is absolutely true, or at least as true as far as I can determine. So happy April Fool's Day, everybody. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers? We'll have links to the text of the 1909 Gazette stories, also Childress's article, Archaeological Cover-Ups, a Smithsonian video of mythologically named Grand Canyon sites, the Coconino Sons article, Looks Like a Mulhattan Story, the Museum of Hoaxes on Joseph Mulhattan, uh, Don Largo, I misspoke his name a minute ago, but Don Largo's piece for the Grand Canyon Historical Society, uh, a kook science page on Joseph Mulhattan, uh, the why files on this subject, also information from on Kincaid's Cave from Astonishing Legends, uh, an article from the Grand Canyon Historical Society, and the Leak Project. Very good. And now it's time to hear from you. What are your theories about the amazing story of Kincaid's Cave and its possible link to Joseph Mulhattan? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Aikens Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for their video and animation work on this episode. They're available for hire, and you can see the kind of work they do by watching Mysterious World videos at my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. Also, um, while you're there, be sure to like the video and, and uh, comment on it, because that tells YouTube that it should share it with other people, so you could help us grow that way. And we are trying to grow the channel. Right now we have just over 50,000 subscribers, but really want to get to it to 100, uh, both because that'll mean more people get to enjoy and learn from the podcast, but also because at 100,000, they'll give me a little play button that I can put in the background and you guys can see is what we've all accomplished together. So uh, please do uh, subscribe to the channel and be sure to click the bell notification so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video, whether it's Mysterious World or one of the other videos I tend to put up every week. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? This Friday, uh, since today is not a Friday, this Friday we're going to be talking about a phenomenon that appears to affect 40 to 50 percent of the population. A huge number of people report being spontaneously contacted by their deceased loved ones. They'll be going about their business when suddenly one of their deceased loved ones manifests in some way. And it happens in an amazing number of ways. So we're going to be doing a two-part look at the phenomenon of after-death communications, including one that I may have had. Wow. Folks, be sure to get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt, like I'm wearing in the video, a mug, or more in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 305. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Tim Shevlin's Personal Fitness Training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. And by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. And by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. Until next time, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World on StarQuest.